for a number of years there at the Ag Division through our consulting efforts, we've been tracking the land resources uh, of you as producers in the area. And what we find out is if you kind of summarize in these broad categories on land resources, about 10% of the land that you operate would be crops, either grazing or for hay or for grain. About 20% is introduced pastures like Bermuda grass, old world blue stems, fescue. And about 20% of it's timber. What does that leave? 50% is rangeland, managed as rangeland. And with the high fertilizer prices, with the higher cost of equipment that's coming out, with the emphasis on wildlife management, rangeland has a new importance different than what we've ever had in the past. And so therefore, we really need to learn and to understand what rangeland management is and how do we manage for that proper health and so that we can have these productive rangelands to help uh, our agriculture production into the future. First principle that we need to think about uh, managing our rangelands is just keeping our soils covered. Whether it's litter or grass production, we need to keep it covered. And it kind of goes hand in hand with the second principle that I want to point out is that you've got to maintain adequate residues. It's kind of a catch-22. If you don't do one, you're not going to have the other. And we'll see this here briefly. Uh, if you look at the summer of 2011 on a ranch not too far from here, this is August. We had an inch and a half of rain. We got about to, took, went out and took a look at it seven days later. And you can look down into the stand. You can see there's a lot of, there's a lot of cover here. There's a lot of growth. Some of those leaves in there are five to uh, six inches long already. It responded immediately even though we were in the middle of the drought of, of 2011. But look just across the fence. Another pasture that they weren't able to take care of as, as they uh, did in this one. Had it grazed a little bit shorter, and you can look down in there, and even though there's good ground cover, you get a little closer look at it, there's not a lot of growth. So if we graze it short, it's kind of like when you mow your grass in your yard. If you mow it short, it's not going to grow back very fast. You maintain a pretty good residual, it's going to grow back even faster. Those residuals at those extra heights, it's not wasted grass. You know, the old, old German I used to work for, one of the things that he told me was, was, you know, I want to use as much as I can. Well, it's not wasted. You know, what we need to do is have some of this going back to be part of our, our ecosystem processes. So in order to have litter, you've got to have grass. It takes grass to grow grass. That's the bottom line. So it's never wasted if we have a good plan on how to use it, either as uh, litter, as stubble, or as part of that factory that's going to produce the next blade of grass to graze. So... Uh, the other benefits of, of managing for the residual heights and keeping your ground covered is spring, it comes a little bit earlier if we maintain a little extra height on your on our grasses. This is uh, last year, uh, end of March. Uh, you look in there, you can see that uh, there seems a, a little bit of a green tint, but on plum, closer look into that little clump, you can see all these little old leaves that are beginning to grow. Some of those four or five inches long already. And if you go just two weeks later and just look at some of the little blue stem in the same pasture, now all of a sudden you see a flush of green. Now last year, you know, it started warming up pretty early, but still, you can see the growth that's there. And if you look down in that little clump right there, you know, there's a lot of those uh, leaves that are up around 8 or 10 inches. You know, it takes grass to grow grass, and that's what's happening. So if we manage it we've oftentimes, or manage it well, oftentimes we're going to have a lot better production earlier in the year just by managing the residuals, okay? So what's another principle we want to apply to our native rangeland? It is provide active rest. And what do we mean by active rest? That is rest to these growing plants while they are still growing. You know, we can be in the middle of the summer and say, well, I've got the pasture deferred, there's no cattle on it, there's nothing growing. It's really not resting. You know, until it's actively growing, it can't rest. So we've got to allow some of the areas to be able to be rested so that we can get some extra growth on these pastures at the right time, especially if we end up with a little bit of moisture. So as an example, one of the things we need to do is plan our rest and our graze periods. You know, and I'm not saying that everybody needs to go out and have a multi-pasture uh, uh, grazing period, but any rest during the growing season is better than no rest at all, okay? You can be mostly continuous graze, but if you could lay aside one pasture and let it rest for an entire growing season, you'd still see benefit from it. But it all gets back down to stocking rate. 
even if you continue to gra to continuous graze, like you see in this uh, research that was done by Dr. Teague over at Vernon, that if you are properly stocked, and then on this ranch, that paddock was, was recommended by the NRCS standards. It was assessed 21 acres per cow. These cattle were radio collared. They put these collars on them. They turned them loose, tracked them for a seed growing season. And where did the cattle stay? Did they go all the way across this whole, whole pasture? No, they used a small part of it. In fact, only about 39% of it. And if you just measured out the acreage that they actually used, their effective stocking rate on those acres that were grazed was more than twice of what was recommended. So what kind of impact are we having? What does stocking rate mean? How can we have that effective stocking rate? And so not only does the grazing animal have effect on it, but there are also some other things we've got to consider is that depending on your rain site, your carrying capacity or the amount of grass that you have out there so that you can develop a stocking rate from changes. And it changes from rain sites as well as the condition. And just take a look at a couple of uh, three of these. You know, we, as it goes from excellent to a poor condition state, you can see the changes in the expected forage production. If we get into a drought and we graze it really hard like we did in the 30s and 50s because we really didn't have a choice and didn't know how to plan forward into the future, oftentimes that productive potential can be lost and this 3,500 pounds all of a sudden may not have the opportunity to ever recover except for a long, long term. In a drought, we can do more damage in a short term than we can ever recover in a lifetime often. If we just take this clay flat rain site, look at it, and we put it on a, acre, a number of acres per cow that it would take, this is where it really gets my attention. As you can see right here, that between excellent down to poor condition, if your cows weigh 1,300 pounds or 1,100 pounds, and I like using 13 because, you know, a lot of times we think our cows are smaller than they are until we get ready and we start talking about, well, I saw my co sold my co cows this last week and they weighed 1,500 pounds. Somebody told me that, Ron, about, about that, didn't they? But anyway, those are the type of things that, we're, that, that happen is our cows are bigger than we think they are. So let's give it a little bit. Uh, if we give them credit to being the size they are, this is the difference in the number of acres per cow to run if we assume that you're going to graze those cattle 12 months out of the year without uh, any type of substitute feeding and that they're going to eat 26 pounds of dry matter per 1,000 pounds of body weight. That's the difference. How many places have we seen anything close to that, especially when you get down into this good and fair condition? Big difference. That's what we're looking at. And this is in a normal year, guys, normal year. Okay, now we put the effect of rainfall. If we were 15% above, that's about 5 inches, and then we could be 15% below, another 5 inches from the average. In this part of the world, if it's 34, 35 inches, that's about 30 inches on the low side. This is the difference from normal, excellent condition range on this clay flat rain site. All of a sudden becomes, at best, 1,250 pounds per acre. It changes. So how is it that you as a cattle person are going to be able to adjust your, your stocking rates? Nobody wants to do that. You know, what do we want to do? We want to stock to a certain number, and we want to do whatever it takes to, to keep that number of head. Part of it's based on economic reasons, but I think that we're not looking at the whole economic picture because we hadn't always calculated the cost on the other side. If we get this number down to a point where you aren't substitute feeding, didn't have to substitute feeding, what would be your total cost then? Something to think about as we go forward. We've got to have a plan. The rest of the time that I want to talk about is what can we do to manage for it? What are the tools that we can implement that might make a difference and help us do a better job of managing for the future? Because you can't manage what you're not measuring. It's kind of like being on a, on, on a diet and a health kick. You know, Joe Springer back here, he's one of the healthiest guys I know and looks like it. You know, I look at me and I'm not near as healthy. If I wanted to be as healthy as Job, I'd have to lose some weight, have to get on an exercise program. And the only way that I can tell if I'm making any difference to where I'm going to get there is what? I've got to measure. I've got to get on a scale. I hadn't been on a scale in a month and I don't want to look at it. Okay. But if I'm going to see any differences, I've got to measure it. So that's what we want to talk about as we look at these tools. The drought monitor, we've already seen what it is. The neat thing from a producer, it gives you an indication of what the soil moisture conditions are you know, throughout the soil profile. That's neat. You know, it may not be the news that you want to see, but at least we kind of know where we are right now. The other thing is that it gives us a three-month outlook. Kind of what do they expect? Now, it does change, 
but it's right there, easily available. If you've got access to the computer, you can pull it up, you can look at it, and at least know about what your area of the world looks like and what the rest of the world around us looks like. So that's a pretty neat little tool. That's all I'm going to say about it. Rangeland monitoring. One of the things that's like pulling teeth, but this is one of the things that if we really want to know the health and vigor of our rangelands, you've got to use some sort of monitoring tool over the long term to see where you're at. The purpose of doing rangeland monitoring is really just to measure the changes in rangeland health over the long term due to your management. Okay, That's really what we're looking at. Now, there's a couple of them. Now, there's many different ways to do it, but these are the two that I like. One, because they're relatively simple. They're, they don't take a lot of time, but you've got to do it just like a physical on a regular basis, once a year, about the same time every year. It's visual, although it will take a little bit of training in order to do that. But if you're interested, this one called Land EKG, uh, another one called Bullseye Monitoring System. You know, in this one here, you can see that there's 14 different things that you can monitor. And the whole idea on this one, for example, is the closer that you are to the bullseye, the better you're doing. And if anything's out of what, a little bit out of kilter, it identifies the things that you need to be able to be working on in order to get it back uh, to what would be a healthier state. So this is the thing to, to, that we like because it is simple. It's something to keep in mind. The, the next thing that we'll, we'll, I'm going to spend a little more time is the water year rainfall table. How many keep the rainfall records? We've got a few, okay, most of you. What do you do with it? Look at it, see how much is in there, uh, pour it out on the ground. Well, you know, that's probably going to be important. We still need to pour it out on the ground while, while we're in drought. But what else can we do with those rainfall records? Well, what we want to do is put it into some sort of table that we can see where we're at cumulatively throughout the year. We've got there's several different ways to set it up, but the main thing is you can either be in like a 30-year average so that you can compare your existing rainfall to the long-term average of some kind. Uh, if you just put, click on long-term, oftentimes you're going to see the 30-year average come up. That, there's benefits to using it. There's also uh, the long-term average would be closer to like 118-year. I like this one better. But both of them have, has its place. Some of the things that you'll see in there that while we call it a water year table is that it begins in October. Why do we bring it, why do we begin in October? Well, the water year, based on like the drought monitor indices for this part of the world, their water recovery year for the soil profile begins October. Temperatures are cooled off. We don't have the warm season grasses really beginning to pull moisture anymore. There's not uh, the, the fear of evaporation. So it begins in October. And what we want to look at is what's the total for the year. Now, it's not going to change a whole lot, you know, from your annual rainfall because it's not. You just put it in a different order. The other things that you'll see that this table is set up, you've got three different uh, areas. Uh, we've got the, the long-term monthly rainfall component. Uh, I like to include the previous year because it often reminds us what last year looked like, and you've got it right in front of you then. And then we've got the third component that uh, mirrors it, but it's the current water year that we're working on. You've got your long-term averages that we plug into this column. You put in the actual rainfall for the month. What it does, it will total it cumulatively to the end of the year by month. And then you get a percent of the long-term average. Where do you set relative to the long term? Okay. Each year, then, we move over to the variance. And this is the key part that we really want to pay attention to. The variance from average, if it's negative, you're in a drought. You're worse than normal. If it's positive, you're above for the year, you know, by month. So you can see how it changes as rainfall changes. Simple, easy to use, okay? So if you look at the 30-year average versus the 118 average, the difference is 4 inches for this part of the world. And that little bit of that 4 inches makes quite a bit of difference on how that table reads. And we'll see that as we come in here. The other thing to keep in mind I'm on, at any time, by the time we start spring, the end of March, 1st of April, we should have somewhere between 40 and 45 percent of our annual rainfall for the water year to have already occurred. That sets up our spring. If we want to have a good spring, it all depends on what the soil moisture is during the winter. And then we've got to pay attention what occurs during the peak growing season. 
And that's the reason why we want to look at April, May, and June. How does it change? How rapidly does it change? Because that's where we're going to get the moisture to grow our summer forages. That's where the remainder of our growth is going to come from through the growing season. Okay? Now, everybody wants to see where are we today? This is where we're at. End of February, we did have about an inch of rain around here. I did include that in here. But we are, depending on which table you use, the 30-year 30 30 average or the long-term average, somewhere between 14 to 10% below what was typical. What did it look like in the 2010-2011 water year? How bad was it in this part of the world? It stayed negative the entire growing season. Now look back. See where we are right here? 16, 12. What does it look like so far? So that's a little bit about the water year rainfall table. It is a tool to help us understand where we are at any given time. Okay. For the last part of what I'm going to talk about is forage assessments. This is the one that's a little more complicated, and it's probably going to take uh, someone that has some experience with setting these up to help you develop it. You know, if any of the consultants can, or or you know, NRCS folks, the people at at the extension uh, could. But there's some several things we need to think about why we would want to use it. And I'll give you an example as we go through it. You know, forage assessment. There's nothing magic about this table. Every table would have to be different for every operation. So it doesn't do a lot of good other than just to show you this is how it's used. Don't get caught up in, in what it looks and what the information says. If you're interested in really using it as a tool, we'll have to develop it for your own operation. So keep that in mind as we go through the rest of the information. So let's take a look at this forage assessment. You know, the main thing we wanted to, to look at is uh, to start with is these critical dates and what do they mean. What we want to do is identify the dates that are important for your operation. And we need to understand at that point in time approximately what percent of your annual production is going to have occurred by those dates. And then relative to your property and your expected production, what does that mean relative to production? Keep in mind that this is, not, is total production, not, total, not the available to be grazed production. And we'll talk a little bit more about that here in just a second. Because not everything that's grown can be grazed. Something has to go back to, uh, you know, to, our, to contribute back to our ecosystem processes. Okay? What we do know is that between April and about mid-July, 65 and 75 percent of our forage production should have occurred. This is when we get our production and how we manage at this point is going to affect us the rest of the year. <clears throat> Critical dates, someone that I like to use about mid-June when I expect about, I mean, first of June when I've got about 30% of uh, my growth there. It also co kind of coincides with that phase where I've probably worked my calves or I'm getting ready to work my calves. I can do some management things around that time. So if I identified early enough and I need to make some, uh, implement a little bit of a drought strategy, I've already got the cows up. I've, I'm working around that, that planting time. So that's where that June 1st comes in. July 1st, early summer. You know, it's right, before, right about the 4th of July. Again, I expect to have about 65% of my production already there. Another good time to be able to say, what do I expect the rest of the summer? How do I need to plan accordingly? About September, September 1, I expect about 90% of my production on the warm season perennial native grasses to have occurred. I can decide at that point, do I need to early wean? Wean a little earlier or a little bit later? Depends on the year. November 1, or right after frost, I want to make another assessment because I've got to make sure I've got enough grass if I'm not going to substitute feed to get back to spring. That's about five months at that point in time. Do I have enough reserve there? And then somewhere during the middle of the winter, I probably want to make sure I have calculated it right and I've allocated it accordingly to get me back to spring. So you, those are the critical dates that I've got in there. All right. Moving on to our livestock demand. Two different parts that we want to look at is, is the, the first one being the annual estimate of livestock demand. And what you want to do is look at about how many days or how many months, however you want to do it, that you're going to be having these type of numbers throughout the year. In this example, you've got 84 cows, you've got some uh, two-year-old heifers and, and some yearling heifers. You've got a number of calves that you expect to be about 45, but they're going to come till end of the year. So I'm only going to be having them on my property 90 days. But the rest of them, pretty much year in, year out, I hope to have about 365 days worth of grazing for them. So I need to allocate that 
per year. That is their demand. And then you look at it to date. If this is June 1st, that's two months. April and May, two months that they've grazed. Estimate what I do have at this point. I've got this number of head, no wean calves. This is what they've consumed. So now we've taken care of both sides of it. Okay. Now into the forage production. The thing that we want to look at is identify your pastures and determine the grazing acres. Not total acres, the grazing acres. That's where our stocking rate, carrying capacity is going to come from. All right. It's divided into production to date, production annually, and then we also have what we call our estimated grazed production. We have to take our total production, multiply it by our harvest factor. If it's native range, it's going to be about 25%. We need the rest of it to be part of our ecosystem processes. If it's introduced pasture, it's going to be about 65%. So these are the things we, we need to think about. Then we do the assessment. The main categories we want to do is look what we have grazed for the two months, what else we have available to be grazed if we needed to at this point in time, add those together, divide that by the amount of production you expect to have on hand for the year, and it gives you an idea about where you should be. Now, if June 1 we expect 30%, we're at 35%, we're probably in pretty good shape as we go forward, okay? So you kind of get an idea how this is supposed to work. Now, it is difficult to know how to assess some of the pastures at times, and the, the level of error can range quite a bit if you're not, well, even if you have some experience uh, assessing pastures, it can range quite a bit. But the main thing is that you have to be consistent, and with practice you can do it. But an easier way, if you can, if you've got a rotational grazing system and you can actually set it up such, where we use reserve herd days. In other words, you know, if you've got some sort of grazing rotation, you can look at the herd, turn them into a pasture, and say, well, you know, they're going to be able to be in there five, seven days before I have to move them. You have an idea just based on your experiences. And this is what this is, is by doing this, by using the reserve herd day method, you can identify five days if you put them in there, seven days, pasture they're in, they've got about one day left before they have to, have to be moved. And then if you want to, you can put it on to a, some sort of uh, actual production. And it's just based on the same concept. A cow's going to eat 26 pounds per 1,000 pounds of body weight. Okay? So that being said, you go ahead and we can uh, sum it all up. The neat thing about it, if you can use it, it is easier. It also complements that good rotational grazing system. So if you've got some growing uh, rotational grazing systems, this would be the method that I would, I would use. Okay? Then the other thing I need about it, if you're not sure about how to calculate reserve herd days, we have calculators. How many have a grazing stick at home somewhere? Okay. The thing is we can go in there, fill out those fields, use our grazing stick, and come up with a number of reserve herd days just by filling out these little uh, fields right there. Pretty neat little tool with a little bit of use, a little bit of practice. You can find yourself getting pr extremely accurate just by using the reserve herd day method. Okay. So we've kind of gone through the tools. We've if I were managing through the drought, these are the ones that I'd be using. The rangeland health principles we've talked about. Remember to monitor, measure, manage proactively. Because as we look toward the drought, we've got to be more efficient with whatever we use, but we don't want to sacrifice the pasture that we have. You know, good years make us all look smart. In years of drought, we actually find out just how well our, or how good our management school skills are. With that, I'm done. Thank you.